Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Paleocrat Diaries on the Meaning of Catholic. And I'll be your host for part seven of the Ecumenical Councils. My name is Jake Fowler. Happy first week of Lent, everybody. No fancy cocktails today. No beer. Just penance. It's good for me. Humbles me. Remembers. Helps me to remember who I am, really, as a a heap of ashes and dust, and why I'm here to love and serve the Lord, not to have too much fun, right? That's the next life. And we also want to make sure they didn't have too much fun before us. So we look at history on this uh, episode, and we realize that for all of the bad, there was good, and it was always mixed, sort of like our lives today, which gives me great comfort. Great hope, as a matter of fact, and joy as I look into the past and I see what a mess it was. And I look into our present and I see what a mess it is. Nonetheless, we left off last time. We were speaking of the Robber Council of Ephesus and how it ended. And uh, Marcion, the new emperor, had been in communication with Pope Leo the Great, and they're going to call another council. The bishops had started arriving. This was in September of 451. And one of the bishops uh, excommunicated another one of the bishops. I'm sure you remember who I'm talking about. Dioscorus, the patriarch of Alexandria, had excommunicated Leo, the pope. And this caused a lot of bad blood, obviously, but it also created some tension amongst the supporters of Dioscorus. So here we are. The Council of Chalcedon opens officially October 8th of 451 in the Church of St. Euphemia, and there are estimated to be about 500 bishops in attendance. Now, I'm not sure if that was on day one or if that's overall or if that, I don't think that's a cumulative total. There's no way. But I think uh, what that refers to would be the max bishops that were there, the total number at one point would have been somewhere in the, uh, five, in the the neighborhood of 500. The battle lines are literally drawn. So if you can picture uh, a basilica, down the left side of the basilica, you have one group of bishops, and down the right side, you have another. And they're seated facing each other. Down the left side, you have the supporters of Leo and the deceased uh, Flavian, Patriarch of Constantinople. You have on this left side Pascasinus, the Bishop of Marsala, who was the papal legate. You have Anatolius of Constantinople, the current patriarch. You have Maximus of Antioch. And you have the Metropolitan Bishops of, uh, excuse me, the Metropolitans and the Bishops of Thrace, Asia Minor, and Syria. And all of their supporters would have been behind them as well. Now, on the right side of the basilica, you would have had Dioscorus of Alexandria, Juvenal of Jerusalem, and the bishops of Egypt, Palestine, and Illyricum, the representative as well of the bishop of Thessalonica. These were the ones who favored Dioscorus. Obviously, they're sitting with him, facing each other inside of the church of St. Euphemia, This is a recipe for a confrontation, if not a disaster. Pascasianus had the presidency. It was given him by Leo himself. And at the very first, he demanded the exclusion of Dioscorus, this man who had taken it upon himself to excommunicate Leo. The court officials, however, the imperial representatives, had objected to this. And they said, instead... Let's have a trial. Now, when you're having a trial, you need an attorney. And who better than Eusebius of Dorylaeum? This was the bishop. We spoke about him uh, in a previous episode. He was initially the layman who spoke up, uh, yelled, as it were, and denounced Nestorius in his own cathedral for blaspheming the mother of God. 
This man is later made a bishop, and it is he who, in fact, brings the charges against Eutyches at the home synod in 448. This is kind of what kicks off this whole controversy here. I mean, we really should blame Eutyches himself, but it's Eusebius of Dorylaeum who draws attention to the matter that, hey, this is a problem, right? And then at the robber synod, Eusebius is condemned by Dioscorus. So now the tables have turned. Eusebius begins the prosecution, if you will, of Dioscorus. And he, be do he, he does that by reading the acts of the robber council. Now, this is one way to embarrass him. Because if you recall from part six, the robber council was a huge clown show. They, they didn't allow the papal legates to speak. They didn't let Leo's tome uh, to get read. They were shouting each other down. And basically, it was Dioscorus's way or the highway. And if you disagreed, you were going to get beat up, like Flavian, who died, or you were going to be otherwise condemned and driven from the city. Eusebius, in addition to reading the Acts of the Robber Council, also had read aloud the proceedings of the home synod at which Eutyches was previously condemned. It wasn't as if it was Eusebius himself or, or he and Flavian, just the two of them. It was a whole host of bishops. And for Eusebius to put that out there in front of uh, the bishops assembled at Chalcedon would have given yet another reason for them to think that Dioscorus overstepped. And finally, in his prosecutorial efforts, Eusebius had Cyril's letter to John of Antioch read aloud, uh, the one that was sealing the formula of union between Cyril and John. And this was the healing of the schism back then. So Eusebius has all of this read aloud before the, the fathers at Chalcedon. And now at this point, the scales are definitely tilting toward the party on the left, that is for Leo and Flavian. Juvenal of Jerusalem, who was a leading protagonist in the robber council, he switched sides. I mean, he physically got up out of his chair and moved over. He recognized his own errors. He recognized Dioscorus's errors. And he repented. He wanted nothing to do with it at that point. All of the bishops of Palestine, the ones he had brought with him in the first place, followed suit. Juvenal's bold move prompted others to abandon Dioscorus also, notably the bishops of Illyricum. Now, as they did this, as they're moving from the right side of the basilica to the left, Dioscorus is getting angry. He was probably angry going in, but now his temper, must, I mean, this, you could imagine the blood vessels throbbing in his head. He's mocking them. He's calling them cowards. He's calling them turncoats. He's saying, oh, look at these strong bishops from the Council of Ephesus. Now, he meant the robber Council of Ephesus, but he's making fun of them as they repent of their errors. But gradually, he's left alone. Dioscorus's theology and his wicked deeds were exposed for what they truly were. And the bishops would have none of it any longer. Dioscorus was a staunch Cyrillian. I believe I mentioned this in part six. He was more Cyrillian than Cyril himself. It was more proper, I should say it is more proper, to refer to him as a Eutychian in some ways, although, to be fair to Dioscorus, he doesn't agree with Eutyches on every single point. Dioscorus thought that it was Flavian who had erred when he professed two natures in the person of Christ, two natures after the hypostatic union. In his mind, this is Nestorianism rehashed, right? This was uh, condemned at Ephesus in 431. Cyril defeated Nestorius back then. 
And so why do we want to say two natures after the union? Remember, for Dioscorus and for Eutyches, the only acceptable way to formulate Christology is to say that there is one incarnate nature of the divine word. This is a phrase that the two of them had picked up from Cyril, but Cyril got it from who he thought was Athanasius, but in reality was the heretic Apollinaris. So the phrase itself can be orthodox. However, if taken to mean that there's only one nature in the person of Christ, then it's heterodox. Dioscorus, however, firmly believed that he was on the side of the truth. He believed he was the orthodox bishop. He believed tradition supported him, as is typical of heretics. He thought he was upholding the true faith over and against the institutional church. Where have we heard that before? And true to form, Dioscorus refused to submit to the judgment of the church on this matter. After all, he alone knew better. This very obstinacy is what makes a heretic a formal heretic. It's one thing to hold erroneous beliefs and then later to be corrected and then recant and repent. Okay, so for a while you were in material heresy, but then when someone brought it to your attention, you abandoned that. You said, oh no, I need to flee from my error. Well, Dioscorus, when confronted with the truth, he doubles down. He's now intentionally going against the teaching of the church. And this willful persistence is what makes it all the worse. His move to excommunicate Leo certainly didn't help anything. It crowns his mischievous acts. And if we recall, the others are as follows. Number one, possibly using Florentius, the imperial official, as a double agent to stir up Flavian against Eutyches, to have Eutyches condemned so as to have a reason to proceed in the deposition of Flavian. Number two, admitting Eutyches into communion after he had been lawfully deposed and excommunicated by his own bishop. Eutyches had fled to Alexandria, and Dioscorus welcomed him with open arms. That's against canon law. And number three, the way he conducted the so-called robber council, right? What he would have referred to as uh, the second council of Ephesus. We call it the robber council. The way Dioscorus conducted that, taking over from the legates, not allowing them to speak, not reading Leo's tome, raising the alarm, having the soldiers rush in, riot ensues, Flavian dies. All of these things are just adding up to everyone kind of turning their backs on Dioscorus. Now, I, I should state that it's true he didn't personally harm Flavian. But again, it seems fitting that he bear some responsibility for that poor man's death. Now, when the reader that Eusebius had employed to read the Acts of the Robber Council and the Acts of the Home Synod and the letters that I had mentioned, when he finished, the bishops proclaimed their belief as following Cyril and Flavian. This is the time when the bishops were switching sides. After all of this was read, they realized their errors, and now they're moving. That concluded the day. It was in the evening by the time they finished, and they were singing the Trisagion. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing that properly. And the imperial commissioners, before they dismissed for the day, they asked for a new creed. The bishops refused at that point. On the second session, this would have been October 10th of 451, the imperial court renews their push 
for a creed. They wanted a statement to combat the prevailing errors of the day. We call it Eutychianism or monophysitism, one natureism. The bishops wanted instead to default to what had gone before, right? And this is good. We should default to the tradition, capital T. They wanted to default to the Creed of Nicaea. They wanted to default to the teaching of Constantinople. They wanted to default to Cyril's letters to Nestorius, to the formula of union, and to Leo's tome. All great things. And when these things were presented before the bishops, the acclaim was magnificent. This is where we get that famous phrase, Petrus locuta per Leonem. Peter has spoken through Leo. This is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the apostles. The bishops are acclaiming their assent, their agreement, their rejoicing over the fact that orthodoxy is prevailing. As a side note, just another little barb I could throw out there. This is an example of early Eastern bishops recognizing the singular importance of the Roman See. Peter is said to have spoken through Leo, not through Cyril, not through John of Antioch, not through Flavian or anyone else, but Leo. Now, the Illyrians, they were not convinced by all this. So the patriarch of Constantinople, Anatolius, he was placed in charge of producing a statement of faith that would be amenable to them, that would convince them that this isn't, in fact, Nestorian in nature, but that this is perfectly orthodox, in harmony with what Cyril taught, in harmony with Ephesus. Their leading man, the Illyrians, that is, their leading man, Atticus of Nicopolis, he wasn't present during the first session. He was present during the ses second session, I believe. And hearing all the discussions, he wants some more time. He wants to think about it. He wants to study Leo's tome. He wants to compare it with Cyril's writings. Fair enough. In fact, at the outset, the imperial commissioners made it a point to say, this is going to be a different kind of council from the second council of Ephesus, the robber council of Ephesus. We're actually going to let people speak. We're actually going to investigate the matters at hand. We're not just going to come in with a preconceived notion of who's right and who's wrong. And so for Atticus to make this request is perfectly legitimate. Do you want to look at it? Take a look. And so, because there wasn't agreement at that time, no statement of faith produced. The third session, a few days later, October 13th of 451, the trial of Dioscorus is taken up once more. Evidently, they didn't finish. Pascasinus, the papal legate, was asked to preside over it. Dioscorus naturally refused to attend. This is a similar situation to what we had uh, with John Chrysostom and with Nestorius. Your accuser is your judge, right? It's the papal legates in league with Eusebius of Dorylaeum who want to depose Dioscorus, and they're the ones put in charge of the trial. I probably wouldn't go either if I were him. However, his, his crimes were rehearsed once more. The Eastern bishops did not want to condemn one of their own, though. So they asked the legates, Pascasinus presiding, to carry out the sentence. This is what he said. Leo, through us and the present Holy Synod, together with St. Peter, who is the rock of the church and the foundation of the Orthodox faith, deprives Dioscorus of his Episcopal office. There's more, but that's pretty much the heart of the matter. Pascasinus, speaking on behalf of Leo, references Peter, the whole church, orthodoxy, and he executes sentence, or excuse me, executes judgment 
on Dioscorus of Alexandria. Anatolius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and no less than 185 other bishops signed the deposition. The other protagonists of the Robber Council were allowed to participate once more in Chalcedon once they had signed it. And these are guys like Juvenal of Jerusalem and the Palestinian bishops that he had brought with him in the first place. So much for the third session. Four days later, on the 17th of October, 451, they hold the fourth session. Now, in that period of time, there's some unease, there's some uncertainty, there's tension, if you will. The Egyptian bishops recognize what Dioscorus did was entirely wrong. But they didn't want to condemn him and sign the deposition because they were afraid. They were afraid for their lives. And this seems to me, this is just me speaking, to indicate that power was more a factor than theology in promoting and preserving the Monophysite heresy. At least it was in this case. Those Egyptian bishops, the ones who hesitated because they were afraid, they were given permission to remain at Constantinople until a good, strong successor of Dioscorus could be installed at Alexandria. Now, this same day, the 17th of October, a contingent of fanatical monks led by a certain redoubtable Barsumas, they charged into the church of St. Euphemia where the council fathers were in session and they demanded that Dioscorus be reinstated or else. Well, things went a little differently this time. They were instead given an ultimatum. Subscribe to Leo's tome or face penalty, not from your own bishop, because he's been deposed, but from the patriarch of Constantinople, Anatolius. They refused to sign. So they were handed over to Anatolius. And I'm not sure what their sentence was, but I am quite sure it wasn't a pleasant one for them. I believe they were all excommunicated. At the end of the fourth session, there's still no consensus on a statement of faith. The imperial officials are pushing, pushing, pushing. They want something to bring back to the emperor, Marcion. They want something to thwart the monophysite heresy. Nothing yet. Five days later, 22nd of October, they meet for a fifth session. Imperial pressure is mounting, like I said. They need a creed, or so Marcion thinks. The statement that was drafted by Anatolius to pacify the Illyrians was offered in its place. But the legates, uh, the papal legates, and the oriental bishops, that is to say the bishops from Syria and those provinces, they objected because it lacked any reference to Leo's tome. So there was a standoff. Now we have the good guys, as it were, the orthodox bishops, saying, well, we need to write a statement of faith. The emperor wants a statement of faith. Why can't we write a statement of faith? We really need to write a statement of faith. we got to have this. Oh, look, Anatolius wrote a statement of faith. Well, it doesn't include Leo's tome, so you can't have that. And now there's tension once more. The Western representatives and the bishops of the Oriental provinces wanted Leo's tome to prevail. The bishops in the middle... Uh, geographically, in the middle, they wanted Anatolius' statement to stand. There was nothing wrong with it after all. It was orthodox. And at this point, the papal legates threw up their hands. They just want to go home. They said, forget it. Forget it. Why are we arguing with you? We came here with strict instructions. We, can do no, we cannot do otherwise. A message from the emperor came. He says, form a doctrinal commission 
or reconvene this council in the West. And so a poll was taken by the imperial officials of all of the bishops present. Are you for Leo or Dioscorus? When the majority answered for Leo, a commission was formed to produce what we now refer to as the definition of Chalcedon, not a creed, a clarification, if you will. The doctrinal commission took up the creed of Constantinople also, which surprisingly, many, uh, in fact, probably most of the bishops never heard of it. Constantinople, creed, what are you talking about? There was a council? In 381, here, there, it was just across the river. Hmm. How is it possible that they didn't know that there was a creed? Nonetheless, however that may be, they examined the archives, they examined the records, and they concluded, well, I guess there's a creed taken up where Nicaea left off, speaks about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. We judge it to be orthodox, we judge it to be authentic. Throw that in there, too. And Ephesus 431, while we're at it, let's make sure we tell them that we think that's a good counsel, too. So eventually, they came up with this definition, the doctrinal commission, that is. It protected against these so-called vain babblings, right? And I've got five things listed out here. Number one, the vain babbling of denying that Mary is Theotokos. Well, that's not directed against Eutyches. That's directed against Nestorius. Number two, confusing or mixing natures in Christ. That's Eutyches. Number three, affirming a double sonship. Back to Nestorius. Number four, stating that the flesh of Christ was from heaven. Back to Eutyches. And number five, denying two natures after the union, Eutyches and Dioscorus. There were also a series of negations in the definition of Chalcedon. The fathers say that the two natures are united in Christ without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. No confusion, no change, no division, no separation. And they used the term same eight different times. Now, after all of this, some objected that this isn't clear. We don't get it. Can you try again? There's a lesson here for all of us, as a matter of fact. Try as hard as you want you will not please everyone. And there's always going to be ambiguity in human language. That's the nature of human expression. We have a certain limitation to our speech. We can only express the truth in bits and pieces. And even when we get it dead on, it's incomplete. Partial statements, flexible terms, some things are just plain ineffable. They can't be expressed. So we should expect that even in councils, there's going to be some ambiguity. There's going to be room for misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Eventually, the definition of Chalcedon was ratified by the legates and 452 other bishops, much pomp and circumstance followed after this. In fact, Marcion himself, the emperor, attended the ceremony which solemnly promulgated the definition on October 25th, 451. Following the doctrinal sessions, there were further sessions on the canons and on discipline. In these sessions, a theologian named Theodoret of Cyrus, uh, who was a bishop as well, the bishop of Cyrus, and another bishop theologian named Ebas of Edessa, 
both of whom had been condemned by the robber council. They were reinstated after they had subscribed to Leo's tome and declared Nestorius anathema. In 431, they were sort of on the side of Nestorius. Dioscorus knew that. In 449, at the robber council, they were condemned as being Nestorians. They were condemned along with Flavian and Leo and Eusebius of Dorylaeum and everyone else. But now, two years later, they're Orthodox. The council finds that they personally are, are Orthodox, so long as they subscribe to Leo's tome. And both of them, Theodoret and Ebus, agreed to his condemnation, that is Nestorius, and again, they were both judged to be personally orthodox. Now we come to the last little part for today. Let me get a little time check. Okay, doing pretty well. During one of the sessions, the matter of New Rome, Constantinople, was discussed in relation to Old Rome, and the infamous Canon 28 was written. Canon 28 says this. I have it here in a book. I'll read it to you. It says, We therefore define and declare the same about the privileges of the see of Constantinople, New Rome. The city now honored with the presence of the emperor and the senate, and which enjoys the same state privileges as the old royal Rome, should be as great as she in what relates to the church and rank second to her. That's a bit of a mouthful. So because the emperor and the senate are now in Constantinople, that makes Constantinople equal in prestige to old Rome, what we call Rome. And it says that her privileges shall be equal, except she'll be second. Or it says her privileges will be equal, and she will be second after her, her referring to the Church of Rome. What to make of this? Since when was the status of the Roman Church based on the Roman Emperor? was based on the Apostle Peter, Peter and Paul, to be exact. It seems to me to be illegitimate. I mean, I know there's an orthodox way to read the canon, and in fact, uh, we'll come to this eventually, I believe uh, several hundred years later, Canon 28 is accepted as a perfectly orthodox thing to say, right? The problem really is the reasoning, the rationale. Well, it's not, in fact, because of the emperor or the senate or any imperial administration that the see of Rome was important. Again, it's Peter and Paul. It's the apostolic see, not the imperial see. And to say that Constantinople will enjoy equal privileges and be second. I'm not really sure how to interpret that in a way that makes sense. I'll do some more reading for next time. But as it stands, it seems to me to be a confused statement. And again, I'm aware that there's an orthodox way to read it. And I'm perfectly aware that the church has since accepted it. But I'm trying to see things as if I were in 451. Nonetheless, we have the bishops gathered in council saying that this is a perfectly fine thing. Hmm. The legates, Pascasianus leading them, they protested. But the bishops said, Hey, you guys skipped yesterday when we talked about it. You knew we were going to talk about it, and you weren't here. And now you want to come back and complain? Come on. That was on October 31st, almost a week after the definition had been declared. 
they stated, the legates stated that um, we can't accept this. Leo didn't give us any authorization to do anything like this. And so they just had to let it be. And the bishops from the East said, we've been doing this already. We've been confirming bishops from other metropolitan areas. We've been hearing appeals. This is nothing new. We've been doing this for 60 years. Hmm. I don't know. The status of the canon at that point was uncertain. The legates are still in Constantinople. After all, they haven't departed and made their way back to Rome to give Leo the update, to say, here we go, Holy Father, here's what we did. That shouldn't trouble us, though, because at that time, the council itself, the status of it was uncertain. It hadn't been ratified, hadn't been accepted or received by the church. So by whatever metric you consider a council to be ecumenical, we're not quite there yet. But that's not for today. I thought it went pretty well. I mean, I've got a little thing going on in my throat. It seemed like it was okay. I've got my liquid penance. Next time, we'll look at the aftermath of Chalcedon and the century-long battle that ensued. Spoiler alert, even though the Monophysite heresy is officially condemned, Two natures in Christ, so says the infallible church. Monophysites still exist. They're still around. They're around to this day. What began in 451, actually, what began before that with Eutyches in the 440s, eventually grew to be open and formal schism, and the churches have still not formally reconciled. We are not in communion with the Monophysite Christians who mostly inhabit Egypt. All right. I should stop talking. I've gone on long enough. And besides, there's always time for another video. Close as we always do. Remembering. Oh, before we do. Don't forget. Right there. You can see it right there. There's Kennedy's book. Tan books. Reprint. Beautiful cover, by the way, Kennedy. Good job on that. And so buy that book. Here we go. Boom. There's Tim's book, City of God versus City of Man. Both of them are available on Amazon. Both of them are sitting right here next to me. I've read Kennedy's book. Highly recommend it. Working on Tim's. It is fantastic. Don't forget to patronize this channel. Support us. Support Paleocrat Diaries. And golly. Never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori.